This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Oh man, I had a little endless laundry list of music that inspired me. Um, Cause like, I kind of just went through phases as any kid would. And I think like, I was really into Red Hot Chili Peppers. I was really into Green Day. I was really, really into Outkast. Uh, I feel like those were like my first, and then Buster Rhymes randomly. Uh, I guess this was like from around seven to like 11 or 12 and then into my teens I became a huge jazz head and was really into Cannonball Adderley and Charlie Parker and um, more contemporary artists like Joshua Redman and Chris Potter and and um, you know then I you know found R&B soul folk music all that my parents played a bunch of that growing up everything from Laura Nero to Nick Drake to Barry White to, you know, the list goes on and on. But yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it was less about the artist and more about the songs for me. Like I, mm. I really, uh, there's a lot of things that I, that I was drawn to uh, and like different, like things that I, that, I, that I would pick apart and like sort of find inspiration from. Um, at least that's sort of how, what it ended up becoming. Um, but but I but I, yeah, I always had things that the artists were doing that I thought was really cool. I, there was never like one particular artist that I feel like, you know, really was the, the one. Yeah, I mean, all of the people that you've mentioned so far are incredible in in their different ways. Um, did you start off uh, listening on CDs uh, or or radio like what? And, and have you shifted now to streaming? Yeah, I started on radio and CD and like I had my own iPod shuffle or not shuffle. I had the, the green nano or the green one, the green, uh, the fat green mini, I think it was called. Uh, and, I, and I had all my, all my songs on there. Uh, and I'm trying to think, yeah, I, I, I still have, man, I, if I go to my, my iTunes right now, it's, it's so messy, you know, it's just like, yeah, it was, it was just full of just whatever. Yeah. Like limp biscuit or, you know, just <laughs> like everything from just like, yeah, like, yeah, it was just all over the place. I think, you know, in terms of like things that I listened to, but I would just save songs and then make my own playlist on, on, uh, on iPod. Yeah. And in terms of like, have, has your the way that you listen to music more or less stayed the same since then, even through the through the shift over to streaming? Like oh, I see what you're saying. No, not really. Or no, it hasn't stayed the same. Like I definitely stream music now uh, quite a bit, but um, I do buy vinyl um, on occasion, and uh, yeah, I do also listen to SoundCloud on occasion too, um, and and sometimes band camp on occasion but mostly mostly streaming does the uh, abundance of choice with music ever leave you sometimes feeling like you don't get a chance to listen to everything that you want to uh and uh and uh, you know do, do you listen to full albums or or is it or is it a case of um you know do you do you not find that to be a problem the kind of like the amount of stuff that there is Oh, it is. It's it's overwhelming sometimes for sure. Um, I I do enjoy listening to full albums. I think I just have a hard time finding time, like anyone. And uh, I think because I'm making music so often, I, I sometimes like. Yeah, I don't know. I, I it's hard for me to like really invest the time to. Uh, but I, but I think in general, like, and I'm an, I'm obviously, I obviously get paid to do this, you know what I mean? So like, 
in general, it's hard, but I can't imagine if you're not a musician, you probably don't even care. You're just like, whatever, like I'll listen to this playlist that someone made for me, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, unless you're really passionate at like, exactly. unless it's either your profession or you're like super Extremely like nerdy passionate. into it, uh, then exactly. you kind of notice. Um, in terms of when you, cause you can play um, loads of different instruments um, when did you like what was your first instrument and how did you start like how did you learn so I started on the flute um, I was seven years old I actually learned by uh, playing on a bottle cap like there's like a I don't even have one here but you know you can basically just take any type of bottle like cap and you can blow across and then you make a sound and that was actually how I learned first and then once I did that it was easy to translate over but that's what the people people mostly have the oh. issues with on the flute is is the embouchure so I started young and and I and I and I was able to get good at it I guess over the next that you know five years and then I and then I learned saxophone in the jazz band and saxophone is easier than flute so um yeah it was it was it was a pretty simple transition fairly simple transition when when did you start on like guitar and other instruments so i started on guitar probably when i was 15 or 16 but i was not good at all and then yeah and then i just slowly 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 got able to play like i, I don't know i just taught myself over like the course of nine years how to like get a sound out of a guitar. Guitar was a lot harder for me, but I think it was because I just, I don't know, like my fingers, like you have to build up a lot of finger strength and I, and I didn't have a teacher and I also didn't, and I was also playing upside down. So there, there was like a lot of things that I had to uh, switch around. Like I, I, I taught myself how to play guitar upside down, but like, because of that, like there's, there's, there's a lot of gaps in my knowledge, but it's more just like a tool. That's why I'm not like, I don't consider myself a guitar player. Like it's more of like a tool for me. Like I don't, I don't have the same type of uh, versatility on, on guitar as I might on something like a flute or a saxophone. Why, why would you say that you weren't very good to start with? Like, did we, were, were you playing also, well, I, did you start playing along to records or did you start like a more, in a more formal way? I just way? I literally had friends who played guitar and I just picked their guitars up and started strumming. But like, man, it was hard. It was just really hard. Like I couldn't make sound. It was like, I had to press my finger. Like it's, it's interesting playing now. Cause I'm just like, oh yeah, whatever, pick it up. But like when you, when you initially start playing a new instrument, if it's not something that you're used to, or if it's not like a string instrument, you're used to string and you know, like I'd never picked up a string instrument in my life. And I was like, you know 15 years old so i was just kind of like this is hard this is just hard and like i don't like it so i would just like try it out for a couple times and then i would just be like uh and then i would quit you know so i wasn't like i just didn't have the same type of passion for for guitar because and i, and I actually attribute a lot of this to being left-handed because like i just learned bad techniques uh no one no one could teach me i didn't i didn't want to like buy a guitar uh i would have had to buy a reverse guitar that like the it's just surprised it's like very there's a lot of like battles to do that you know what i mean like they don't sell those you know and i didn't have i wasn't sure i was going to be a serious musician so i was just like well why would i you know i'll just teach myself this way upside down you know so at the time i just kind of like i've developed very bad habits and and uh worked my way out of them eventually but i'm still not like I still am not like your guy if you're looking for a guitar player. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, I can, get out. I can get ideas out. I can do. Can do. Yeah, that. It seems like you're pretty good at that. I have to say. Uh, and uh, what, what about uh, singing? When, like, when did you start like making your own music? So I started making my own music. I guess. Well, I started making beats when I was in college, uh, which I guess you can consider. Like, I did like fully instrumental productions uh, in college. Uh, and then I was a DJ and then I, I would like play around Washington DC. Uh, and then I also did remixes in college. But then when I first started making my first like vocal music, I was probably like 21. 
uh, yeah, like just graduating. It was like like I was just graduating college uh, when I when I first started making uh, my own productions that were like with me singing on them, uh, and and I took like a few vocal lessons to like try to improve for that my voice, you know, a little bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then, and, and, and then yeah, I was always into like, huh? Well, I wanted to, sorry, uh, it's one of those things with Zoom. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask, um, but it's, it's pretty cool, like, well, very inspiring, I think, for people listening to this podcast who are on the fence about pursuing their music, diving into music full time, uh, people who aren't familiar with your story, you know, might not realize that you were kind of like in a completely different uh, industry, doing something totally different. And then, um, you know, you decided to work on your music full time. Like what, what yeah. was that actual story for people who don't know? Yeah. So, I mean, fully transparently, I, uh, I graduated from college with an international affairs degree, uh, you know, with a concentration in urban development. And I, you know, also was a minor in jazz studies. Um, and I was looking for jobs and I literally was not that, I mean, I, I loved urban planning and geography, but I was just kind of like, I don't know how to get a job in that. Like, I don't really, so I just got a job in, in real estate. And um, I worked for, as a leasing agent for about a year. And then by just over a year, there were certain like, ticker marks that they use to be like oh you know you're gonna get a promotion but like i i was good in certain areas but i wasn't very good at my job in other areas so they ended up firing me uh and i was already planning to move up to new york at that point because i had started to like record my own music and was like feeling good about it um and i just kind of like started like working with friends who were like other artists in New York City at the time and started like meeting people and going to shows up in New York a lot so like that was all through SoundCloud um which was how I, I would attribute that but like yeah so I got fired from my job got a new job working on the ad side of mar marketing and real estate and basically worked at that for a year saved up a bunch of money and then quit that job pretty much a week before I got hired to do this like production gig in South Korea. Uh, and huh. that was like completely separate from Cautious Clay because I, I, I mentioned I was like a beat producer before, like I was making SoundCloud beats and it sort of had a reputation for that. So I actually produced some album for a few, I produced a few albums for these, for some rappers in Korea. Uh, and um, month later cold work came out so uh it was all just like timing and like i had sort of started you know i had finished blood type at that point so i was kind of like cool putting out cold war and it was it was definitely a good reaction it wasn't like insane yeah. but you know it's it pretty was definitely good like whoa. yeah it's like the first song i released is you know the song that ends up you know on a ton of tv shows and random movies and whatever so you know it was uh it was cool it was cool but that that is like the long and short of it i feel like it was like i just saved up a bunch of money at this real estate job and i was like super unhappy there and i just i just didn't fit in with anyone like i just yeah there, there there's definitely like i mean I, I definitely feel sometimes like a little bit of a uh what's it called um Oh shoot! When you're like, yeah, you, like, you don't feel like you belong sometimes. Like it's like you feel God, like God, you're God. an outsider. Yeah, um, I still feel that sometimes in certain ways. Like, uh, but but I think it was like really bad where I was at in real estate because like nobody listened to music. Like they didn't care. They didn't care about <laughs> music. Like, uh, how is this possible? Like, you don't care about music. Like, yeah, yeah. it's very. It's when you're really into music when you're obsessed with music and and really considered to be of great importance like as an art form it is really really frustrating and mystifying when you speak to people and they just don't care and it's a bit like that thing that you were saying earlier 
you know, uh, well, maybe if you don't care about music, you just put on a Spotify playlist or whatever. Like, you know, yeah. it is kind of like that with so many people. But exactly. if you're, if you've, if you know how to make beats and you know how to make write songs and play things, and you, you know, you're into all these, into all the, all of this music, like it just yeah. so no, frustrating. What do people actually care about? I know, I know. I mean, you know, they. I'm not trying to diminish what they like, but I definitely. No, no. Working in sales was not for me. Like that was not the guy for that. So, um, you know. I could do a good job, but I was like, this is soul sucking, you know, like I can't, I can't do this for the rest of my life and, and work for some random guy who's like worth millions of dollars so that <laughs> I can get a promotion and like, whatever, dude, like, ew. For that benefit. Yeah. yeah. I, in terms of, um, you know, transitioning to working on music full time, was there a part of you like thinking that that's what you wanted to do whilst you were real estate? uh at that real estate job and um you know did you ever kind of uh feel like god like when i'm at work i could be making music and like i'm kind of like wasting my time by not making music yeah i definitely did i mean i well i thought i honestly thought like look like i i don't know if i'm gonna do this music thing like i don't know if it's gonna work but i knew i was really good at it like i knew i could i knew i could do a good job at music somehow. So like, I was like, worst case, you know, like maybe like if I don't break in the next eight months, maybe I'll find a job at a engineering studio or maybe I can, you know, work at a label. I don't know. I was just like, I literally wanted to do anything that related to music. So I, I felt like, you know, I needed to go for it. I was in New York city, like, I'd saved up money. I'd like almost paid off all my student loans um, or at least like half of them at the time. So like, I was kind of like, this is, this is, this has got to be it. Like, this has got to be the time that I do this. And I was paying like $600 in rent a month. So it was like a great, you know, financial situation. I had no responsibilities to anyone. Uh, yeah, that was really, it was just an educated, uh, educated guess, I guess. <laughs> And was 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 Cold War what you'd consider to be the turning point that that started you uh, on your on your like solo career, or was was there another moment that made you more sure that you were going to be in this for the long haul? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think when I got my first licensing, it was actually like right after I put out Joshua Tree, which is the second song I put out. Uh, that song got picked up for like a huge licensing fee like a sync for this company uh this headphone company and when that happened i was like oh my god like i just couldn't believe it because like i didn't know people just like made money like that you know like work some random commercial and then you somebody throws you this like huge chunk of money and you're like i would have made that in a year you know what i mean so like i was just kind of like whoa that happened you know so yeah, I guess I guess when that happened, I was like, okay, game on, you know, because I was like, there's no way that I'm going to ever do a real job again. If this is like, if I can do this and people pay you this much money to like, you know, just do what you love, do what I love, like, oh my gosh, I need I need to try this, you know, I need to like keep going for this. So I kind of think about that moment is sort of like the moment when I was like, okay, like, I got to keep this up, you know, so and and in terms of you know like making a full length album um yeah. you've got you've got one coming out june the 25th deadpan love yes. uh, what what has made you because obviously you've made eps and you've made great records but like what's made you wait to make a full album i think i just wanted to mature as an artist like i, I took I, people always think this is surprising but like and like I don't know. Cold War was 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 a song that I made, and and uh, I was just starting to get into singing. You know, like I wasn't. Mm. I'd been singing for maybe like a year at that point, um, and I guess I just wanted to build my confidence a little bit more in like in like how and like also build sort of like a story around like who I was and and 
in, as a musician and like as an artist. And, and I think like making this album now felt like a good time for that because like now I know like well, I'm a touring, I'm also a touring artist. Like I, I tour, I toured a bunch before this album even came out. We did, you know, a thousand plus tickets in a lot of markets. And like, I think like that was a sign as well, where I was like, okay, well, you know what? Like, I don't even have an album yet. And like, people are coming to these shows. Like I need to, I need to put an album out, you know? And uh, that's incredible. I don't know. To have built such a, such a following. I mean, I, I guess, you know, like if you actually add up the amount of music that you've put out though, it's more like, just cause it's you not. Know, like, it's almost like I've had an album already, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And how does, how, how, how has it felt these last few years? I mean, obviously COVID has stopped all the, all the touring, but yeah. what, what was it like working, working up to the stage of being able to sell like a thousand tickets, you know, like was that, was that like dream come true type of stuff? I mean, yeah, I, I honestly like didn't even, it, it was, I had no frame of reference, you know, because I'd never done that before. So yeah, when we did like, 2000 tickets in New York, I was kind of like, wow. okay, that's crazy. You know, I don't even know how that happened, but um, I think, I think I just, uh, I don't know. I, it kind of gave me like the confidence to just at least like invest in my, my live show, you know, and like really like push that side of who I am a little more because I, I never, like music for me is, is always sort of just been fun and kind of intuitive. So I, I don't know. I think also maybe it's just like the fact that I am pretty open about my process and sort of like the fact that, you know, I did all these different things in my life and, and that's a part of my story. I think like maybe people sort of can feel like they're connecting to me in that way. Like, you know, when I'm playing on stage, it's like they know like the history behind like yeah, I pull out the flute, I pull out the saxophone. And then that becomes like this whole narrative because like for all intents and purposes, if you've never seen my show, you might just think I'm some like R&B artist, singer guy, you know? And mm. so like, I wanted to like actively, like when people came to see me, I wanted to be like, yo, I also love jazz. Like I also love like folk music. Like I love other things a lot. And, but I also love R&B and who, get, who gives a fuck? Like it's all good. Just mm. like- I'm just, I just want to unapologetically be myself, you know, and, and I think that like, regardless of whatever people see on social media, or like, you know, experience not in their realities, like, I hope like they connect to like that element of who I am, you know. Mm, for sure. I think unapologetically being yourself and, and also, uh, also the fact that you're sort of saying that like coming to see you live is how you could understand your artistry better than through social Definitely. media and that kind of goes for everyone or right or at least everybody who's capable of playing live because like let's face it on social media like you, you need photos and short videos to be a star whereas to play live you have to play for a very long length of time and and if you want to put on a good show it's actually got to be live which is really exactly very difficult so um and and in terms of the new album uh who did you collaborate with um on it because you know i read an article in pitchfork uh that tobias jesso jr was involved um like you co-wrote some stuff with him and i, I love his his actual he his solo record i think it was from like seven or eight years ago he did a solo yeah. record which is wicked yeah, yeah. i thought i love tobias man he's such a good friend of mine we uh he was one of the first people who we I worked with like in LA when I first started putting music out. Um, right when I put out Joshua Tree, he actually his team had reached out and we like worked on stuff. And um, yeah, he's just a great dude. Uh -huh. I love him. Um, but he he did this really really sick piano line. It sounds like a sample. It's a I don't know, it's a song called Whoa, um, and it, it sounds like a, it sounds like a Wu Tang sample. It's so cool. He like sat piano and just did this like. It's like this really cool, like, yeah. His his style of piano playing is also just really unique. What was why I was like, yeah. 
it was fun. It was so fun making that song with him. Um, but but yeah. And then in terms of who else did you work with and where did you where did you cut this album? Like and over how you know long a period was it? It was it was a pretty pretty long period. I mean, like uh, like that song we wrote probably. Oh, I want to I want to say like February, February twenty twenty, um, and then pieces uh, bits and pieces throughout um, this year. And then or like middle of last year, obviously, like it's, that that song was in person. So that, that was before COVID uh, had started. And um, yeah, it was it was it was the, the album, the process of making it was really like some of it was like all here. And then some of it was um, in Massachusetts. Um, some of it was in the UK I randomly was like making some stuff like a while ago on this song um what song was it it was uh bump stock bump stock uh part part of that I, I had recorded there and like um but a lot of it was also just in New York and LA and and basically what I would do is like if I was working with someone I would start a song with them and then they'd send me stems or like you know, I'd write it down and record it and then I'd take it home and then finish it. Um, so that was really like the process of getting this done. I basically like executive produced the album. So like there's a song like Roots, for example, I worked with Dan Nigro and and um, Jimmy Stack also worked on it, but he wasn't in the room at the time. He, he did the drums on it. And um, basically like the song was almost done. And then I just wrote my entire song to the track that was already done. And then I, I basically made some small, like she sent me all the stems and I made a bunch of small adjustments to the production and then I re-recorded my vocals at home. So like, that was kind of like the process of making that song, for example. What do you, what do you prefer in terms of recording your vocals at home or recording them in a studio? I like working in a studio. I just need to be, you need to be a quick engineer, you know, like I hate, like, I kind of like, like working at home more because I feel like I don't have to think about, oh, you know, like what, what's this person doing? Or, you know, do they know what I need on my voice, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, it's hit or miss. Cause like, I think some really good engineers like, oh man, I love working with a, an incredible engineer. Like there's nothing better, mm. but I th it's more consistent when I'm just in my room, I guess. You know? And then what about in terms of the, having the, the vibe and the atmosphere to be creative and and kind of do, do you not struggle with that regardless of where you are no i can kind of be creative anywhere i'm at i think it just like depends on my head space like where my where my what my state of being is if i'm feeling kind of like stressed out or i'm feeling kind of like i need to i don't know yeah like i need to like not in a situation like I, I you know i won't it'll be difficult for me to focus you know but i think i can sort of focus anywhere really you know if i need to or if i want to really and in terms of the album like is there is there an overriding uh, message is there a narrative that runs through this album or is it a collection of of songs um that, that, yeah. that kind of differ it's a great question so it really is sort of dialing back to the not the title of the album deadpan love it's um it's really an album about like who i am as a person um but then also like the relationships that i held that i hold and like how i see the world um through this kind of lens of sort of feeling a little bit like cynical and like i use like a lot of like sort of direct witty lyricism to sort of like highlight things in a funny way or sort of in a sarcastic way obviously like relating back to the word deadpan and mm -hmm. then love is obviously sort of like i feel like i'm a very earnest person at my heart at my core like i'm i i do feel like i want to do my best I, I feel empathetic i feel a lot of love um but i also feel like i hate everything at the same time you know? <laughs> so like i sort of have this shell around myself you know where i can sort of 
see the world through through that lens like it's it's like a deadpan love you know like that's kind of like where the the title came from um and in that in that way it's kind of just like my my outlook like it's like a layer of sarcasm to protect my inner layer of like honesty um, yeah 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 i think there's a lot of people who who could relate to that and in terms of you know you could tell uh that that there's a lot of kind of wit there um even just from the song titles and uh has that side of things as as the wordplay lyricism always meant a lot to you does that mean as much to you as the music or does the music always come first oh man it means almost as much for sure i think i think i went through a period where it didn't you know it's similar to i always compare this this interesting idea because i think that's also what like partially also why like i felt stifled by jazz and i didn't become a jazz musician because a lot of what people think good music is is like oh you play a lot of notes or like you know you kind of like go into this world and you just like you know but i think the best jazz musicians the best music musicians in general they craft a sound for themselves you know they craft like this way of being um same with producers you know and there was this whole back in 2014 this whole slew of producers who i kind of came up with on soundcloud who were just churning out beats, churning out beats, and they all sounded like basically the same, you know? And they got popular, you know? And they and they, they came in and people loved it. But at the end of the day, it was sort of a formula. And that formula runs out if you don't actually have anything to back it up with. So I guess like I think about music in the same, it, it doesn't matter what type of music you're talking about. If you're talking about making beats, you're talking about jazz you're talking about folk music it's like it's all the same in in its in its in the way that you approach it it's so it's so important to approach it in a holistic type of way so like when it comes to like how i wanted to represent myself as a musician as an artist i feel like the the production elements to me were important but like almost equal or secondary to the lyricism and the delivery and like how I decided to approach it. Because like, that, at the end of the day, that's also a production decision, you know? Like how you sing something is a, is totally a production decision. Mm. And me as an artist having to make those production decisions like was, it, was fascinating to me. It's an interesting part of the process because like it really emotes how people are going to react to it, you know? Um, and so I guess I say that all to say that I, I think the writing and, and the and the emotiveness of whatever you're singing or how you're singing it is uh is it's sort of inseparable from the process of the production you know as well and, mm. and it, all, it all needs to sort of like just like a good stew you know it needs to simmer it needs to like breathe a little yeah yeah there are, all these elements are crucial and i mean particularly when you talk about uh and I guess this is probably quite prevalent among some jazz musicians, but uh, I guess across all genres where people are focused on the the chops and the shredding and the playing loads of notes and, and kind of the showing off elements of music. And I mean, don't get me wrong, it takes a lot of discipline to be that good oh, at, sure. at that, that, was, that was not me shooting on that, by the way. No, no, no not I at all, that. I know. Yeah. But it's, it's, not, it's like not a proper sound. And, and to a certain extent, uh, like sometimes that stuff isn't that pleasurable for the listener like i mean it's easy to forget but people who don't know anything about theory about about chords and their complexities can mm -hmm. think that like literally a, a one four five or whatever you know like or simple major chords as far as they're concerned that could be you know beethoven's ninth that could be uh, augmented 13th chords or something like if you don't know then you don't know what sounds good sounds good it doesn't matter uh, what goes into it and so with that in mind i wanted to finish off by asking as this is the greatest music of all time podcast you know in terms of lyricism in terms yeah. of, um who, who would you say are the, like the, the artists whose lyri lyrics um have resonated a lot with you oh man um that's a great question there's a there's a few I mean, I was also really big into poetry, like like uh, Ocean Vuong. I love his poetry. I also love uh, E. Cummings. 
a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. I also really, really love, like my favorite rapper of all time has got to be Earl Sweatshirt, I think. He's just insane, insane mind. I don't understand his mm -hmm. mind at all. It's just absurd. Like, I like I don't know. I There's a lot of great rappers, but he he's an incredible lyricist, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I guess, Oh, I got, I'm trying to think of like me, lyric. Cause I also listen to a lot of melody too. And I love, I mean, I love, I love Joni Mitchell's melodies. Like they're just so good. Uh, mm. So amazing. Just like consistent, consistently interesting. Um, yeah. Really interesting. I'm like, I'm definitely, Oh, Oh, I know. I also really I, like, something also about like the talk singing and things like that is just really interesting to me like uh like sort of like this like uh, like the red hot chili peppers like the kurt vile approach you know where it's just like kind of like early like cast mccombs like i really like that kind of style as well of, of lyricism where you're sort of like loosely telling a story and there's all these specific objects in the story but it, like it's so memorable you know yeah i don't know yeah that's that all interesting to me i don't know but but that's a different that's like a different kind of style too than like than um like sort of like the classic approach to like oh man because yeah who am i who am i think smoky smoky robinson you know mm. just a just a classic classic songwriter right there you know yeah really really amazing lyrics um yeah. to all of his songs i mean yeah pretty timeless no better sure yeah do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalize your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh so if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.